When you lack confidence, you basically lack the very engine that can propel you into the successor fear. No matter how great your skills, talent and dedication, your actions will be deprived of that energy capable of manifesting into reality those things designed by intention and imagination if you're not in touch with yourself, trusting your essence and your true potential. Have you ever felt paralyzed by self-doubt and gave in to hesitation only to have regrets afterwards and sink into lower self-esteem even for a little? It's okay. All of us have. And all of us need to learn how to develop more self-confidence so we can pursue our dreams more empowered. If you're ready to commit to taking your self-confidence to an unprecedented level in your life, this is the time to do it. What stands between you and the success you might have, the accomplishments you are capable of, the prosperity you deserve, can be much easier to overcome than you might imagine. The first thing that you need to be confident about is that you too can become extremely confident. Even if you can't find the resources to believe that, give yourself a chance and you might find your life changed. Confidence is what you get when you have cultivated the right habits. This reveals them to you along with tips on how to apply them. You already have various habits which pay off more or less in terms of what you want from life. How about replacing some of those habits or adding seven more and finally become that highly confident and successful person you can truly be? Confidence, for many the mother of all traits. If you don't share this view, you may ask why. I'll try using my personal experience to make it a little clearer. Throughout the years I have met and talked to many successful people. While every single one of them seemed to emanate to such a high degree pure unadulterated confidence, with some of them I actually got to address the topic itself and the answer was always the same. It's a process that is always progressing depending on how much of yourself you invest in it. Rarely, confidence just drops from the sky like a gift from the heavens. It is built. It's true that some people tend to be naturally more confident than others, or that this process we've mentioned does not take the same amount of time for everybody. It's common sense. We're different, and that's a good thing. However, with the right set of tools, anybody can shake off their shyness, reserve and uncertainty, and become more in touch with themselves and with their true potential. Because, ultimately, it's about that exact inner potential that's hidden most of the times by our own layers of doubts and fears. But this potential is always there, waiting for us to release it and manifest all those things we are capable of and which, unfortunately, we deny ourselves much too often. Confidence nurtures action, and action leads to success. But first we must find out those things that nurture confidence itself and cultivate them in such a way that we strengthen this core to the point we can no longer fall back to our zone of fear and disbelief, even if our plans don't always succeed, even if we are exposed or expose ourselves to voices that willingly, or not, speak to bring us down. You don't have to feel guilty for not scoring big time in the confidence department. You can be just as big as you think you can be, but also just as little. You owe it to yourself to tap into the source that can unleash all the creative force you have within you. Even if you're having doubts such a force could exist in you, or although you feel you have it but its strength is nowhere near the strength of your fears, the fact that you are listening to this now shows that you want to tap into that source and are allowing yourself the chance to elevate from whatever level of confidence you find yourself at this moment. The sooner you start seeing confidence as an ability that could be worked on and improved, the sooner you will notice your first results in this respect. No matter how powerful external events and negative stimuli can be, once you get to master this ability, you will actually feed off the apparent adverse circumstance and be inspired by the most opposing odds. You will literally have people around wonder and even ask what is your secret. Some believe confidence cannot be taught. You either have it or you don't. They're wrong. Some of the clients I've trained had plunged so low in the abyss of insecurity that they were having a hard time finding a reason to live. One of them even told me it took him two months to finally decide and email me after initially receiving a recommendation from a mutual friend. He was so desperately in need of a boost in self-esteem and confidence, he eventually gathered his courage to call in for help. And he was so glad he did. That act alone revolutionized his behavior. 
After only one session with him, he left my office noticeably more confident than he had been in a very long time. I didn't perform any magic on him, and didn't let him in on any long hidden secret. I simply prepared the setting where he would be better enabled to focus on his strengths and see them with enhanced clarity while setting aside his weaknesses. The plan was to prevent the shortcomings and failings he was constantly bringing to his attention, to such a degree that would alter his perception on himself extremely negatively, from preventing him to extract as much confidence from even his little success as he could. Even the fact that he had admitted his imperfections and turned to someone else for help showed great courage. That courage needed to be converted to light and used as fuel for gaining confidence. This process must be done to follow through with every little positive trait and action that we have and perform, because ultimately confidence is merely a balance between what you consider in your favor and what you tag as negative, unfavorable. We make a habit of concentrating on our negative traits, our defects, our weaker points. We exaggerate them. We give them power by never confronting them for fear of failure. Even after one session of dealing with this lack of confidence and trying to better understand it, that man learned the importance of keeping your eye on the ball, that is, never letting go of the things that you are good at or make you feel good. It's like having three big suitcases and only the possibility to carry two with you. One will have to be left behind. So which one would you leave behind? The one less important, less relevant for you, for your well-being or survival, of course. In this case, that suitcase that you need to leave behind is the one with all your doubts, hesitations and weaknesses. Ask yourself, why do I need to be more confident? I know it may sound stupid, but do it. After you give yourself an answer, allow me to also encircle one. People who lack confidence have a constant excessive dependence on the approval of others to feel good about themselves, to feel they deserve one thing or another, even to be happy and successful. When you don't trust yourself and your abilities, you get into the habit of avoiding taking risks for fear of failure. And believe me, that's one heck of a habit. Not being confident means expecting to fail, putting yourself down, and paying infinitely more attention to criticism than to compliments. Walking into confidence land means being willing to expose yourself to the disapproval of family, friends and strangers, because there is something there more precious than any opinion, your truthfulness to yourself. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Marianne Williamson I invite you to learn to trust your inner voice and accept yourself for who you are, while always trying to improve yourself. What I offer you are seven best friends on your way to self-improvement. Seven habits which all highly confident people are aware of and constantly apply in their life. Habit 1. Put on the self-confidence suit. We all know how important image is. Think of commercials. Think of photos with a deep emotional impact. Think of a food that tastes maybe delicious but looks so darn unappealing. Think fashion. Even think movies. We are extremely visual creatures. Image matters. But when I say image, I'm not just simply referring to a two-dimensional picture. I mean the whole reality it generates and the ideas, thoughts, emotions it suggests, connects and associates with. If you saw or met someone without them even uttering a word, or even more if I just showed you a picture of someone you've never met, probably more often than not you would dare to guess if that person has self-confidence. Why? Because image, what that person chooses to display, or naturally displays, speaks volumes. There's this quote from Brian Tracy which is quite relevant in this respect. It says that, Confidence is a habit that can be developed by acting as if you already had the confidence you desire to have. This doesn't mean confidence is something to be easily faked and it's just a matter of who's more skilled in doing that. It doesn't even mean that if you're low on self-esteem and you start deliberately displaying some sort of confidence, you will actually develop some just like that in the blink of an eye. No. But confidence does start with being aware of yourself in any way possible. Consciously perceiving yourself choosing the way in which to speak, behave, dress, 
relate to people, does work miracles. Acting with a higher level of confidence than you actually feel you have can construct an image of a confident you so powerfully that people will naturally perceive you as a self-reliant person and will be attracted to you. Let's consider for a moment the image of someone with a high level of confidence. Think of their behavior, their body language, their way of saying things, and the volume and tone of their voice. Regardless of your background, system of beliefs, and the goals you have, you will agree that physiology is extremely relevant when it comes to estimating and recognizing self-confidence. Something as small, apparently, as the way someone shakes hands, answers the phone, or enters a room can be a huge statement or portrayal of the level of confidence they have. I'm guessing the way they dress and care for their body is pretty obvious to everybody. You're not going to see too many self-confident people neglecting the way they look or walking in a flabby manner. Let's check just the fundamentals of improving your self-confidence. Those things you can start applying right away at a physical level. If you want to boost your confidence, you need to start working on your image. Adopt a proper body language. Keep a good posture. Be conscious of the way you walk. Look people in the eyes when you speak to them. Maintain a straight vertical position of your body and no slumpy shoulders. Make sure not to retreat into your own corner when at parties, events or gatherings. Cross your arms when talking to someone. Speak too low or too loudly. Look good. This means working out regularly, eating healthy and dressing sharp. Never underestimate the power of an outfit that looks good on you and makes you look good. It's going to make you feel good, too. Emulate confident people. Again, this is not pretending to be something you are not. This is getting inspired by those people you admire and borrowing some of their tools to construct your own ship on which to sail to deeper waters. Find those models or things that resonate with your true self and learn by imitation how to model the image that ultimately will come to represent what you have become. Acting with confidence, even to yourself, when you most seem to lack it, is one of the most courageous and beneficial things you can do for yourself. Take the words of Michael Arndt. I like to begin every screenplay with a burst of delusional self-confidence. It tends to fade pretty quickly, but, for me at least, there doesn't seem to be any other way to start writing a script. Habit 2. Constantly work on their self-development. Okay, let me tell it right off the bat. You can't have self-confidence without self-improvement. As I mentioned before, this is a never-ending process, and those who are determined to achieve a high level of confidence, as well as those who already enjoy one, understand this at a very deep and also empirical level. This process is part of their day-to-day -day life. It's an adventure on which they embark wholeheartedly. Maybe one would imagine that successful people already know the lesson. They did all the learning and now they're just applying it, or enjoying the fruits of their success. Far from being true. This is often exactly what makes the difference and sets an accomplisher above the rest. The willingness to keep learning, keep discovering new sides of life. But don't just take this as a rigid must, an imposed 24-7 job, a principle with no fun stemming from it. Actually, fun and joy are the real must here. If it doesn't fulfill you in any way expanding your knowledge, skills, and life experience altogether, what's the purpose of doing it? Or, from the other perspective, when you are enthusiastic about something, investing time and energy into it will not seem like an obligation. A while ago, I was coaching this 34-year-old woman who had received a few sessions with me as a gift from two of her friends. They were trying to find something that would help her balance herself and offer some motivation to pursue living beyond her job and her daily not-so-joyful routine. They were hoping she would actually find something to get excited about. It wasn't too hard to observe how tightly she was clinging on to her limits and limitations. She once told me she was satisfied with what she was and knew, and this frenetic search for improvement is merely a proof of insecurity. For her, life had a very logical course where some people were like this, others were like that, some were good at this, others were good at that, and the rest were kind of wasting time. Excitement doesn't put food on the table, was one of her armor phrases. This can be a deceptive appearance, pardon my somewhat pleonastic expression. While you might think this is what someone aware of themselves and with a thankful attitude would say, 
it is actually a trap, hiding a fear of genuine self-discovery and for questioning the beliefs that have built their identity. Highly confident people are not afraid of going beyond their limitations and beliefs. They always remain open to learning something new and expanding their knowledge and understanding. Maybe you say, okay, but where should I start? Perfect. Let us give you some pointers where you could begin or continue this adventure of self-improvement. Watch interviews with highly confident people. Read books on spirituality and self-improvement to gain different perspectives and information on how to remain focused on the things that matter and don't give in to trivia. Get in the habit of working out regularly. Remember the aphorism mens sana in corpore sano, a sound mind in a sound body. Work on your communication skills. Practice public speaking. Learn body language. Get organized and disciplined. Develop daily habits that can get you closer to your ideals. They should definitely include healthy eating habits. And ask for guidance, help from others. Low self-confidence isn't a life sentence. Self-confidence can be learned, practiced and mastered, just like any other skill. Once you master it, everything in your life will change for the better. Barry Davenport Habit 3 Stay in the company of other confident people. Maybe now you're going to argue something like, yeah, but I don't have confident people around me, so where can I find them, and how can I get to stay around them? Well, even if it doesn't seem that easy at first, take this as yet another chance for you to practice confidence. Trust that you will find the right people to inspire you to a more daring relationship with yourself, and you will. Just paying attention to those around you and noticing how they manifest or not this trait is an excellent exercise that can give you useful insight into human behavior. I can't stress enough how important it is to become a good observer of what's going on, both internally, in terms of how different circumstances and stimuli affect your emotional plane and your thinking, and externally, how people behave, what affects their behavior, and how their behavior affects those around them. Apart from this, take any group of people, or any two or more individuals, and you will most definitely see a difference in confidence levels given enough time and reflection. In other words, one is more confident than another. Observe what motivates that person, talk to him or her, and gain more understanding of what feeds this attitude. Remember that an open mind does miracles when it comes to connecting with people and learning from them. Do not refuse yourself any chance to explore beyond your own views and perspectives. Even when you come across an opinion that totally contradicts your beliefs, choose to see it as a way to exercise your ability to debate and even to question your own theories. A lack of confidence may sometimes simply mean a lack of ability to support your views and principles through your words and actions. Maybe those views and principles themselves need strengthening. Bring them more often to the surface and address them at first with those close to you or those you trust until you gain the freedom to discuss them with anyone. Furthermore, when you find yourself constantly in the company of self-confident people, you will notice how that confidence tends to rub off on you. It's as if you are tuning yourself to their frequency. Stay only among complainers and people with low self-esteem and your confidence will become like Stalingrad in World War II, the constant target of terrifyingly heavy bombardment. Yes, all that whining and complaining are affecting your ability to stay present and focused on what motivates you and brings about an intense mental fog that others will perceive as well when in your company. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to notice that rich, successful people kind of hang out with their own breed. However, this doesn't necessarily make them shallow. It's not about the money, but about the attitude. Poor people feel intimidated and anxious when among rich people, and it's only natural that successful people choose to spend time with those who share, some of, their vision of life and have access to the same levels of experiencing life. At some point it's not even a matter of choice anymore, because the world, the context in which they operate, does the filtering by itself. Habit 4. Refuse the role of a victim and keep a grateful attitude. If there's something my experience and line of work has taught me, it is that no one is spared hardships and challenges. Ultimately, they are the ones to shape us. Ultimately, they are the teachers. 
Remaining in a state of true confidence means not allowing problems and life's struggles to get you to the point you comfortably, as contradictory as it may sound, adopt the role of victim. On the other hand, don't start feeling guilty now if sometimes you feel sorry for yourself. Rest assured, we all do. It's human. However, the extent to which one does it can make a colossal difference. If those moments of feeling sorry for yourself become too frequent and take longer and longer to snap out of, then you might hopelessly fall into the self-pity pit. Climbing back up can then prove to be a bitch. Yes, once you dress up as a victim, everything will turn into a predator and you'll only get invited to the misery party and served cold dishes. Playing the role of a victim goes hand in hand with being ungrateful. So a very efficient way of combating this defective attitude is to always tap into gratitude. Don't doubt for a second that people abundant in confidence are not also abundant in gratitude. The latter, however, cannot be imitated or acted. It's either genuine or it's not. Sometimes we feel the need to fake gratitude to save appearances and look more in tune with ourselves in front of others, either by pretending we're happy with the current situation or by bringing to mind or talking about people more miserable than us, which sometimes can indeed be a useful kick in the butt when we become too much complainers. But the thankfulness we have in mind here relates and refers to a very honest and profound feeling. This feeling has a lot to do with being present, with cultivating awareness in every aspect of your life. It has also to do with a higher degree of understanding life itself and the laws that govern it. Highly confident people are aware that being grateful means planting a seed for future success. It's the law of resonance in action. The more grateful you are for what you have in your life, the more things to be grateful for will you attract. It's funny how many people struggle for self-confidence and resort to so many techniques and methods but overlook this tremendously powerful habit of being grateful. If you find it difficult to develop this habit, here's something you can do to make it easier on yourself. Take a few minutes every day counting your blessings, acknowledging those small things you like about yourself, those things that you are glad to be part of your life, those things that you have accomplished in the past despite difficulties. Habit 5. Always keep their promises. We are all familiar with the saying, a man without his word is nothing. But not all of us are able to grasp the significance it bears, or, even worse, sometimes we ignore it altogether when we hit a few bumps on the road and choose not to see past our immediate interest. Furthermore, we use words and phrases like, I promise, or I give you my word, way too easily, attaching no weight to them, eventually ending up not living up to them, becoming proficient at finding excuses to justify our inconsistency, lack of empathy, and selfishness. The thing is that when you make a habit of coming forth with justifications for breaking your word, no matter how relevant or compelling they may appear to be, it doesn't compensate anyone, but instead it cripples your integrity and self-worth. You see, when you promised something to someone, you're also taking a pledge to yourself. By not following through, you're only going to deteriorate your image as an individual, your relationship with other people, but also your self-esteem. It's just like the American author, businessman and keynote speaker Stephen Covey once said, Honesty is making your words conform to reality. Integrity is making reality conform to your words. Integrity is really the key to the whole idea of being the person that anyone can trust. In order to be trusted, you need to have a strong set of principles that must never be broken under any circumstances. When you're able to earn people's trust, you're given this extraordinary gift of influencing them in a positive and constructive way. While it's understandable that keeping a promise can at times prove to be difficult, or even, apparently, disadvantageous, it's all about training yourself not to forget that what you gain from not keeping your word is incomparably less to what you gain by sticking to it. Our words must always match our actions, or we will end up losing ownership and control of our own lives, as well as sabotaging our sense of self and blemishing our inner power. Dr. Seuss once said about this connection between intention and manifestation and its importance. We say what we mean, and we mean what we say. When we break from this pattern and say things we don't really mean, we move out of integrity. So, rather than throwing promises here and there all the time, just for the sake of appearances, 
or for an immediate fix to a situation, take time to consider how damaging the effects of disappointment are. Language, the very cornerstone of any society, has this immeasurable power of turning something that has not yet come to be into reality. That is not to be messed with. It may sound cliched to you, but your word is gold. Use it only when you know you can deliver, and be assured that those who are relying on it will respect and fully appreciate you. Your word, if you allow me to make this parallel, is your currency. You are the only one that can give it value and stability. Habit 6. Make strengths their focus point. Focusing on your strengths is equally important. Here's why. Our strengths are reflected by our personal traits. They enable us to do things the right way. It's also essential to realize that, besides knowing what your strengths are, being able to know how to use them, which involves focusing on them, to your advantage is a must, and this will require a great deal of effort. But first things first, let's see what you can do to become aware of them. It's not as easy as it may seem to determine what your strong points are, at least not on your own. And this was one of the reasons that caused psychologists to come up with a solution, questionnaires. Amongst them I'll mention Martin Seligman and Chris Peterson, the two founders of positive psychology and also the authors of a widely used handbook called Character Strengths and Virtues. Based on their research, 24 universally valued character strengths are identified. However, this doesn't mean there isn't room for more of them to be found and to be explored. Human beings, after all, are the most complex creatures in the known universe. Furthermore, to continue with this scientific approach on human capabilities, I'm going to mention that other researchers have incorporated the aforementioned character strengths into four major classes – intellectual, social, temperate, and transcendent. You will find that you can be creative, curious, open-minded, brave, kind, forgiving, humble, and prudent. I'm only naming some of the most obvious and popular ones. I believe that every person has at least five of these traits, I'm referring here to 24 of them, attached to their personality, so consider establishing yours by asking yourself the following questions. Does this strength feel natural to my personality? Do I feel good about it? Does it excite me? How much of this strength do I use? And do others see it as clearly as I do? If you're unsure, ask them. As far as the second part of our debate is concerned, mainly why is it so important to focus on your strength, the answer is provided once again by psychology. According to Martin Seligman's beliefs, an overall feeling of happiness and fulfillment is sure to take over if you're able to focus on and use these strengths for the better good. Isn't happiness everything that we strive for in this life? In addition, According to the Pareto Principle, you can read more about it on the internet if you're interested, the more you filter the things that are really worth focusing on, the more successful you'll be. Each and every one of us comes with a set of strengths and weaknesses. Some choose to dwell on their frailties, while others prefer to invest all of their energy into trying to make it in territory that is unfamiliar to them. It's they who carry the heaviest burden, because they choose to walk an unknown path by solely relying on their strengths. It's time you let yourself free to focus on your pluses in order to pursue your deep-seated passions. If you're able to do that, it will come naturally to you to determine whether it's worth investing all of your energy in an area that feels difficult to cope with or not. Habit 7. Find joy in helping others. As important as it is to help yourself when facing the numerous trials that life has set out for you, Helping those around you doesn't come any less important. However, if you go through a low self-esteem phase, or have been lingering on too much in it, helping others, or thinking you can be of help to others, may not really be your focus. Listen on, and you may change your mind, and maybe even your focus. At first it's difficult to grasp the notion of helping others when you're already feeling down yourself. But this is exactly the point. By doing something for your fellow beings, you're also doing a lot for yourself. You're raising those levels of self-worth and the levels of vibration you're operating at. The more you help, the more meaningful your presence becomes. It's a fact. Those who have gained a deeper understanding of life 
have come up with a hypothesis of constructive activity, which explains that by simply offering a helping hand, one can improve his or her own life experience. In other words, by helping your fellow man, you're taking the necessary steps that ultimately lead to your development as a human being. The truth is that people with low self-confidence are more likely to focus on their own problems and weaknesses. The question is, if they have enough energy to maintain this flow of critical thinking about themselves, why not redirect that energy into something more constructive? Is it because they find it useless to help themselves by helping others? I don't think so. I believe it's because they're not allowing themselves to reach that full potential by creating these unnecessary barriers within their minds. The best way for you to gain confidence is to prepare so well on something that there can be little chance to fail. Frank Cummins Lockwood As for those of you who have no problems with self-esteem, here's what you can do. Pay attention to their problems and don't let their negative comments about themselves go unchallenged. Give them rational feedback while highlighting the things you truly admire about them. A false compliment will only make it worse. Trust me, they'll know the difference between someone who's being emotionally politically correct with them and someone who really appreciates their qualities, even if they're not ready yet to accept them as such. Keep a positive attitude no matter what they say. Invest in them as much time as they need. Don't rush them. Last but not least, share your knowledge with them. One good example is to offer them books that you know may help them, just as they've helped you in the past. A wise man once told me that one can never have enough sense of self-worth, and that he must always concentrate his efforts into giving worth to others. I'm going to conclude with a quote from C. Joybell C., who said, Every second that you spend on doubting your worth, every moment that you use to criticize yourself, is a second of your life wasted, is a moment of your life thrown away. It's not like you have forever, so don't waste any of your seconds. Don't throw even one of your moments away. Whether or not you like the results it gets you, you cannot deny that your mind is a formidable tool. Actually, the more you do so, the more you fail to understand, and thus benefit from, the influence your thoughts and words have on your reality. Your brain is the architect of your reality. This incredibly complex organ is equipped with over 100 billion nerve cells that participate to a highly elaborate network of communications that ultimately is behind our way of experiencing life in terms of sensations, thoughts and actions. Emotions start in the brain and are influenced by our thoughts. In their turn, they influence the way we act and behave, and the way we act and behave shapes our world every second. This is why to be the master of your world means to be the master of your mind. Confident people are always working on achieving this sort of mastery because they have acknowledged its power. But any mastery is achieved through discipline and discipline involves habits. I'm confidently telling you this. Most of the people you admire or envy for their achievements, fame and wealth or even happiness have obtained all these through constant discipline and by adopting at least some of these habits. I'm saying most to exclude those who simply inherited their wealth and maybe even some of the fame. Confidence is all about believing in yourself and resiliently pursuing what you want. Dare to believe in yourself, dare to be yourself, and you will know the true meaning of Ralph Waldo Emerson's words. To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Start applying these habits, or at least some of them, today and regularly check to see the progress you've been making by keeping a journal and noting down your experience with this unfolding process. Keep in mind that once you have achieved a certain state of confidence, it will act as a powerful manifester, attracting into your life things and people that will bring their own contribution to your success. It's like having received an unlimited card for indulging your fashion pleasures at Chanel Boutique on Rue Cambon. Remember that confidence is a matter of choice, can versus can't. Don't let your mind dictate the path you should follow. Create one for yourself and let your mind obey it and contribute to it by sustaining only the thoughts that are helpful to this purpose. We don't deny that there are some factors and circumstances that can have a great impact on your confidence and that do not depend on you. But this is the perfect way to start using one of the habits previously described. Focus on your strengths. How you perceive yourself 
will teach others how to perceive you. Harness the power of your perception, master self-confidence, and success will be yours. Always focus on what you can control and sharpen your mind each day until you yourself become an inspiration to others, which will help them activate their true inner potential. There's no bigger satisfaction than that.